Hi, welcome back. Today, I'm going to show you how I modeled a cute office room. Here's what it's going to look like by the end of this time lapse. I'm starting with a cube and setting its size to 6 meters. A room can roughly be 6 meters in size. I don't really care about the precise scale when I'm modeling an illustration like this. If it would be a game asset, it would be a different story. The important part is that objects in one scene are correctly scaled relatively to each other. But you can't set the scale too small or too big, because then it's gonna influence uh, all sorts of things like shaders, and uh, you'll have some problems with clipping distance on the camera, and you just get into more trouble than you would have if you just uh, chose relatively correct scale to begin with. To add thickness to walls and the floorboards, I used Solidify modifier, and then on top I added a bevel modifier. After the general shape of the room was done, I worked a little bit on the lighting and the colors. For my basic lighting setup, I usually use Skytex Chernishita. It's an adjustable HDRI-like texture where you can change things like diameter of the sun, rotation of the sun, elevation of the sun, and its intensity. It's a pretty useful tool for basic lighting setup, especially if your machine is powerful enough to be able to make changes in cycles and preview them easily. Skytex Chernishita Sky only works in cycles, unfortunately. Here you just saw me model a window. And now I'm adding glass material to it. By default, glass material doesn't really let enough light through in Blender. To fix that, I'm using a mix of glass BSDF with transparent BSDF and a shadow ray light path as its factor in the mix shader node. I want this room to be an office, but an office of an artist. I'm definitely basing some of it off my dream office that I'm thinking about. But also, I just uh, found a lot of references on Pinterest with aesthetic desk setups, so this is what I'm going for. Here you just saw me use Add Primitive Cube tool that I was talking about in the previous video. As you can see, it's a very useful tool for blocking out the scene really quickly. Speaking of blocking out the scene, this is not really something I did in this video, because I was preparing for the video and I already had a sketch and a pretty good idea of what objects I want in the room and where I want them to go. Usually when I'm just designing a room, or any scene for that matter, I definitely block out the scene, definitely look at the composition, and I wouldn't have gone into such details here on an easel, for example, if I didn't know what would be, for example, in that corner next to the table. Since I'm thinking about this room in terms of a series of five isometric miniature dioramas, I want it to be coherent with the other ones. I think it's pretty common when an artist wants to make a series of artworks, so it's probably important to understand what you can use to make artworks look similar to each other or look like they belong to the same series. One of the tricks that I use is use the similar color palette. Also, if you've seen my previous video, if you haven't, there's gonna be a link in the description for it, but in the previous one we made a cute bathroom scene, and if you watched it, you probably have recognized the wooden texture that I just added to an easel. Using the same color palette and using the same accent colors, or in my case, accent texture, is definitely gonna help make the scenes look close to each other, look like they belong to the same family of artworks. Another cool thing that I'm gonna do a little bit later is reuse some objects. This especially helps if you're building some sort of a world, be it for a game, graphic novel, just a series of illustrations. So not only you're saving time, not having to model the same type of object twice, but you're also adding some nice clues for people who are willing to pay attention to your work. So that they can think, maybe it's a room of the same person, maybe it's the same house, just a different room, or maybe it's a completely different person, but still, they live in the same world. It's a very tiny piece of environmental storytelling, but I feel like it adds a lot of richness to your illustrations. Here you can see me model stripes of leather going around the chair. 
To do this, I'm using Quick Menu add-on that I mentioned briefly in my previous video, but you can definitely do this without an add-on as well. What you would need to do is separate an edge loop into a separate object, then you convert it to a curve so that you can add depth to it, and then if you need it to be mesh, you can convert it back to mesh. This is what the Quick Menu add-on is doing under the hood. You can see that I'm assigning the colors and materials as I go. It helps me get a general feeling of the composition, because colors just affect the composition so much. I used to not do that, and then I would end up liking my clay renders much more than I like renders with color. I think that's probably because color was an afterthought for me. So now I'm trying to incorporate color at the earliest stage possible. Here you can see me model a pretty typical office chair. So where are the wheels then? This is a good example of me prioritizing the look of the final image compared to functionality or realism in the scene. You would probably expect some wheels on this chair, but I'm realizing that it would make the chair too tall, then I would have to raise the desk, then I'm gonna have all this awkward space under the desk, then I'm gonna have to figure out what to put there. So I guess at the end of the day, it's not that unrealistic to not have wheels on the chair like that. Um, so I decided to just emit them. Here you can see me use solidify modifier with the bevel. This is what I used a lot here throughout the entire tutorial. And I wanted to mention briefly why I use modifiers versus using something like extrude along normals, which is, by the way, my absolute favorite shortcut in Blender. It's Control F F S S for the even offset. And it's amazing. It's really good. But it's important to understand why you need to use modifier versus using a tool. So making a non-destructive versus a destructive change. Usually making a destructive change is easier and faster. So if you know that you're not going to make any changes to the object later, if you know that this is the way I want it to look like, I'm not planning to change anything about it, then I don't usually use a modifier for that. With a modifier, you need to separate this part of the mesh that you want to modify. Then you need to adjust the modifier, set it up correctly. Here, for example, I'm using a ray modifier to make holes in the computer because I don't quite know where I want them to go. I don't know how many of them there needs to be. I don't know if I want them to look thicker or thinner. So this is something I would use a modifier for, something that I'm gonna adjust. Here you can see me add emissive material to the holes in the computer and to this little button. If you're using cycles and not Eevee, an emissive material will actually emit light, but you can see me add an area light right there. Why do I do that? Usually I find it easier to control the light, because the light source that I want you usually see on the other objects, right? Not on the object itself. You see the nice edge highlight, for example, on this like monitor and uh, stand under the monitor. But if you're trying to achieve that nice rim light with just the emissive material in the PC case itself, then you might just blow up the highlights too much. And in general, it's just easier to have two things to control other than one. I guess I actually add a lot of light sources everywhere. When I get asked on streams how many lights I add, the answer is usually yes. I'm all for realism if you can achieve it. If you can add a light with an actual light source that's present in the world, like if you can put a lamp on a desk and add an area light from it, it's gonna look great and it's gonna make sense. But what I've noticed is that it doesn't always have to make sense, and the result of it looking great, and adding more lights always looks great, in my opinion. <laughs> so the result of adding more lights is that you can get a better control of what objects you're focusing on by adding some rim lights, by highlighting certain things, by putting other things in darkness. So basically you're creating more contrast. And all of that definitely adds a depth to your images. It definitely adds a lot of like visual interest. It guides your eye. 
So what I'm trying to say is that it doesn't make sense not to add as many lights as you really need in the scene, because they're such a great help. And in my experience, people don't really notice that there is no light source there, that there is no lamp that's emitting that light. At least I never got any comments on Instagram saying, this looks okay, but, but where is the lamp that's emitting that light that's uh, bouncing off of this little thing here? Here, when I'm modeling the keyboard, you can see me use a super helpful tool, Split Faces by Edges. It's in the Mesh menu, you can press Alt-M and access it from there. It's super useful and you can separate things like keys on the keyboard. I also made the floorboards in all of the videos this way too. I guess now that I'm modeling a keyboard with like under 20 keys on it, is a good time to mention stylization. When I'm modeling a scene, I already have an idea what the goal of the image is going to be, how I'm going to use it, where I'm going to show it. And a lot of the time it's on Instagram or anywhere on social media, on Twitter, even on ArtStation, you see previews of images, you see small images. And a lot of the time I don't want to add details that nobody's going to be able to see. So what you're not modeling in a scene is almost as important as what you are modeling. Deciding what are the most important features of this thing that you're modeling. What makes a cute aesthetic office a cute aesthetic office and what you can emit. Those are the questions that I find harder to answer for myself. That's why when I'm asked on Instagram about the future of AI generated art and how we as artists are going to continue moving forward. I think of designing things first, deciding which objects you want to add to the scene based on what story you want to tell. That's the hard part for me. And that's not the part that's as easily automatable. Designing, making decisions, telling stories that you personally want to tell, building worlds that you personally want to build. That's why in this series I'm trying to not just show how I use a tool, but talk about why I'm doing certain things the way I do them, what I'm thinking about composition-wise, color-wise, how I make decisions. Because this to me is the essential part of art. The part that's always going to be there, no matter what tools we're using, AI or no AI. And here's our result. Here's the cute artist's office scene. Do you think they're using AI tools? Do you think they're using Blender? Thank you for watching. I really hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any comments or questions, leave them in the comments down below. I'm gonna check all of those out. Subscribe if you wanted to see the next video. Bye!